Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, for the opportunity we have to study your word again. And Father, what a wonderful way, as we've said before, to start the day. Help us, Father, to be lifted up by the study of your word, the recognition, Father, of your power, the recognition of your way. Help us, Father, to always strive to be part of your way, knowing in the end your way wins. Father, we know that there are a lot of times that we can feel as if that's not true, given what is going on in our lives, so how Satan tries to tempt us into thinking that it, it isn't worth it. And Father, we want you to, we ask you, Father, to help us to stay strong, to realize that your way is best and that your way is in our best interests. Father, we, we pray to you that we always let others know this as well, and that we live our lives in such a way that they can see our lives and see God's word as we live it in our lives. We love you, Father. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Ah, Nanette, good to see you. Good morning. Okay, we are in Psalm thirty. How you got me on Psalm 39? Look at that. Psalm 36. I turned over to see what Psalm 39 was, and and uh, and I got off my page. We're in Psalm 36 this morning. Um, uh, this is a, um, <coughs> a wonderful, it's a wonderful reminder. The latter part of the of the uh, psalm is going to remind us of a few things that we've 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 noticed before, but perhaps not the exact same things. Uh, that we noted, but the way it begins is one of the things that really makes, is interesting to me. Um, we oftentimes will think about, and we prayed about it just a little bit ago, uh, about the idea that those who are in the world, a lot of times, seem to have it made, at least right now. Those who are in the world seem to not have any consequences for what they are, for what they are doing that is evil in their lives. And a lot of people will will have have times in their minds where they they think, why isn't God taking care of this? And uh, in to the point that our society will oftentimes go in deeper and deeper, sadly, into evil because there doesn't seem to be any rip repercussions, and because perhaps people are. Uh, seem seem to be doing better um, when they are in the midst of doing evil, and uh, quite frankly, the idea that well they're getting away with it, why not? Um, and then society starts into a, a a a way of thinking that the way I'm doing it is correct, the way I'm doing it is better. And you'll see what I mean in the first couple of verses, the first three verses or four verses. Of, uh, of this psalm. And, and that's what I want to spend some time on, a little bit of time on this morning. I don't, want to, I don't want to neglect the rest of the psalm, and we're not going to. It's only 12 verses. And so how long can that take, right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's, only, it's, only, yeah, it's only 12 verses, so, so we'll, see. We'll, we'll see the entire psalm. But I want us to especially reflect on the first part of it. Um, let's read this psalm, and then we'll, we'll come back and go through it. Good morning, Mary. Good to see you. Good to have you here with us. Okay. Transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for it flatters him in his own eyes concerning the discovery of his iniquity and the hatred of it. The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. His pl he plans wickedness upon his bed. He sets himself on a path that is not good. He does not despise evil. Your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God, and the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. 
they drink their fill of the abundance of your house, and you give them to drink of the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. O oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you, and your righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come upon me. Come, I'm sorry, and let not the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the doers of iniquity have fallen. They have been thrust down and cannot rise. Okay, let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and start this. Notice I, I mentioned those first four verses. <clears throat> those first four verses are speaking to looking at what is in the, uh, the ungodly's heart. Now, this is not going to be something necessarily that starts right away. But eventually, the, the heart of the ungodly, the one who is, not, who is not desirous of doing God's will, in fact, just the opposite, you know, revels in the idea of staying where he or she is and perhaps even getting worse. Uh, that is the mindset that we're seeing here. Look, look at his first verse. Transgression speaks to the ungodly within his heart. I love the way it personifies sin, okay? The very sin itself speaks to the ungodly in his heart, all right? Given what the rest of the verse says, what is this transgression saying to him? Not, not the rest of the verse, I'm sorry. Yeah, the rest of the verse in verse 2. What is this transgression saying to him when it speaks to his heart? It's okay. Yeah. Keep on, keep on going. You know, Satan's always, uh, in a, he'll always suggest there's no danger in disobedience. Yeah. Why change? If it right. looks good and feels good, do it. There you go. Mm -hmm. If it looks good and feels good, do it. Why change? Those people are being judgmental who think you should. By the way, do you realize how old that idea of your being judgmental is in the Bible? Do you remember when the, the idea was first brought up in the Bible of evil people saying, you're being judgmental or you are judging us? Do you realize it goes all the way back to Genesis in Sodom and Gomorrah? When Lot tried to talk those people out of sexually assaulting the two men who had come among him, who were angels, and they said, when when Lot said, "Don't do this," uh, you know, "Don't do this," um, and he actually offered them his daughters, which I don't want to come into, but he says, "Don't do this," and um, they said, "Look at this man; he comes among us as a judge." You see that? They're saying, you know, he, Lot was a foreigner. He wasn't originally from that area. He came in there and they're saying, you're coming in here and judging us is what he is, what they were saying. That idea of, that idea of you're judging us as if you can tell us what we're doing is wrong or what we shouldn't be doing what we are. And yes, Bob and Julie are exactly right. Satan is saying, go ahead and do it. It's who you are. It's what you want. It's, it, it, you know, people shouldn't be looking down upon you because of it. In fact, in verse 2, it says, well, no, let me finish verse 1. There is no fear of God before his eyes. You know, that is one of the things. Hey, Dwayne, good to have you with us this morning. That is that is one thing, that uh, that idea of the fear of God. We've seen, again, again in Proverbs chapter 1, down around verse 7, the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. That's where we start out in recognizing that God is someone that we should be respectful of and we should fear what he will do if we aren't doing his will. Nothing wrong with fear. First John chapter 4 says, perfect love casts out fear. That idea of once we have a, a mature love towards God, there is no need for fear. Okay, but, but at this point, there's no fear in this man's eyes who isn't seeking God, and there should be. He should realize that God is going to require something of him one day. If he does not, if he fear does not. Fear can do the right be reverential. Thing. I'm sorry, what's that? 
fear can be reverential. It can. It can. I think eventually that's where it needs to get to. Understand Understand me on that. There's no reason for someone who's doing God's will to fear him. And so, yes, sure. that idea of fear can be reverential. But there is plenty of reason for those who are not doing God's will to be afraid, to fear him. Sure. You know, but you're absolutely right for the... For the maturing individual who is recognizing I need to do God's will and who's seen the 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 fact of not just the re reper repercussions if you don't, but also sees the correctness of doing so. Yes, that can certainly turn into reverence, most certainly. And so and so there's no fear of God before his eyes. For, and here's the reason there's no fear. Look at the reason. Because that word for in verse 2, or whatever you have there, therefore, or for, look what it says. For it flatters him in his own eyes. Now, what is the it? Remember, you take a pronoun and you go back to the noun of verse of verse 1. What's the it? The transgression? Yes, yes, ma'am, very good. That personification of sin, that, 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 that idea of uh, that the transgression, it flatters him in his own eyes. Sin. He deludes himself into thinking that no one else knows. Yeah, well, it could be deluding himself in, the, in that no one knows, but Bob, it can also be putting him in the mind where he doesn't care who knows. Look, look at what he says in the very next verse. Concerning the discovery of his iniquity and the hatred of it. Okay? The idea, it flatters him in his own eyes that people see that he is doing this and they dislike it but he is flattered by it think about that what we see what we see today uh, i remember one individual uh, a a famous actress right now i can't think of her name but if i could i wouldn't mention her but but she actually wears a t-shirt that says i enjoyed my abortion okay think about those words Recognizing that there are people out there who, who find abortion disgusting for good reasons. People out there who, who, are, who are mortified at the murder of a little child. And then, and then the very fact that they don't like it, she wants to, she wants to, uh, um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? She wants Flaunt. to, what's that? Flaunt. Yeah, she, yeah, there's a, there's a good word. That's not, that's not the word I was thinking, but that's a good one. She wants to flaunt in it. I was thinking about what a hog does in the mud. <laughs> she wants to wallow. Wallow in it. There it is, wallow. But flaunt is probably an even better one. She wants to flaunt the fact that it bothers them. She wants to enjoy the fact that they are disgusted by it. And so that she can show her feelings about this action, which she doesn't think of as a sin. Let's understand that. She doesn't, she doesn't care one way or the other, probably, but she doesn't think of it as a sin. So she is, she actually is uplifted in her heart because people are seeing what she, she is doing as evil. Okay. As wicked. And so look how old this idea is. We see it in our, in our everyday lives today. And I just gave one example. We can all, we can all probably think of other examples where people are happy to say, yes, I did that. Yes, I'm Those doing parades that. they have every year that you and I know about that celebrate sin. Yeah, yeah, the parades that celebrate celebrate sin and, and wanting to flaunt it in front of other people, sexual or sin. The, or the looters going out of the stores, smiling and waving at the cameras. There you go. Very a very good example. People who are who are doing something that they know is not is frowned upon by society, and, and for that matter, thievery. They certainly wouldn't like it if someone stole something of theirs, but they are they are happy and flaunting the idea in front of in front of cameras because the cameras are there. They th this is the idea I see here. The sin itself flatters him in his own eyes. He looks upon it and says, "I want to be known for this. I want to be seen as not caring about doing this." Okay. Yes, most certainly. Sometimes people feel they can get away with it. But I believe this verse 2 is taking it one more step. The people who have been getting away with it, and they don't care. All right? Hold your hand right here. And let me, let me show you the next step that follows that. Go with me to Romans. Romans chapter uh, 
1, the very end of the chapter. In Romans chapter 1, we have a, a long list of sins that begins with not willing to admit there is a God, even though the things around them shows that there has to be a God, verses 18, 19, and 20. And following that, we see a spiraling down into sin, a going down further and further into, into various types of uh, debauchery, various types of degrading sin. All right. Now, when that all happens, all sin is, is now on the table to be done. And look at what it says. I'm going to, I want verse 32, but look at what it says starting in verse 29. Okay. And because that's important because the end of, in verse 32, he's going to, he's going to make mention of those sins. Start with verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, unworthy, I'm sorry, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Look at where it finally gets. Not only do they do those things, knowing that they're wrong, but they give hearty approval to others who do those things. This is a society that has spiraled down horribly into the pits of sin and doesn't care, morning Janet, and doesn't care about that fact. In fact, they are doing like we see here in verse 2. It flatters him in his own eyes concerning the discovery of his iniquity and the hatred of it. And then it goes to the point and they enjoy the fact that others are involved in it. There is society all the way down. And by the way, do you see America right now? <laughs> wow. And especially when you go up a couple of verses above what I didn't read that was going on in their day, okay? And he's talking about he's talking about doing indecent things, men with men, women with women, doing that which is not natural. We are in we are in this time period. And like Pat mentioned, a, a very a very good illustration, but also a very small illustration when you think of some of the things that we see is people looting and smiling at the camera on their way out. So proud of what they have done, you know, but there's the attitude. There's the idea that we see. Uh, Nanette says sin can become so commonplace that people think it is not, it is not a sin and certain sins are glorified as making strides in progress towards being more acceptable. Excellent point, Nanette. This is where this is where it ends up getting to. And 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 God spoke about that. Where is that? In Isaiah is it Isaiah 45? Where he, I can't remember which chapter it is. Maybe it's not even Isaiah. But but where he says they call evil good and good evil. Do you see that today? Those of us who are trying to to bring society back on the right course are being called uh, bigots. I mean, not not talk about racial bigotry. Talking about bigotry against people or or against people who are doing sinful things. In other words, we should allow them to do it, or else we hate them. You know, we're haters. We're phobic. All right, homophobic. Those words that are being used about us. So yeah, society gets to the point then where it all gets flip-flopped, whereas doing evil Isaiah is the good thing. Isaiah 520. Isaiah 520. So I had I, I had the book right. I was, only four, yeah. I, I was only 40 chapters off. That's not bad. Okay. Isaiah, Isaiah 520 is where that is. Morning, Aunt Mary. And morning, Ease. Good to have you with us. Easy. Good to have you with it's us. It's on the screen. Ah, there it is. 
uh, uh, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. All right. I love that next verse with it. So 20 and 21 of Isaiah chapter 5. And, 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 and look at that. You can just see our society today and how, it's, and how it's gotten to that point. So when we're reading this first part of Psalm 36, we are talking about the, one of the biggest problems with our society today. Okay? Um, so so he, he, it flatters him. I want to read that verse 2 again. It flatters him in his own eyes concerning the discovery of his iniquity and the hatred of it. That just makes him happy. He just feels like he is being glorified in the fact that people see that he's doing it. He's a leader. He's someone who is leading the way. All right. And look at the way he's leading. Uh, look at verse three. The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. All right. Uh, the idea of, of, of thinking things through, of, of considering ramifications, of considering what truly is right, he has ceased to do that. That is no longer on his agenda. Instead, on his agenda is to keep on doing what he's doing. That's his agenda. And for that matter, to help other people become like him or, or her. I don't mean to be putting it on one gender. Albert, okay. Yes. Wow. There's something else in this verse, too. Okay. That with the wording, just the grammar indicates that it's one who really knows better, but they continue on their own way. Mm. They knew the truth, but they turn away from it. But Second Peter 2.21, it's better for them or some person like that never to have known. Right than to learn and then turn away from it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And once again, the idea of Romans chapter 1, 18 through 20. They know there's a God, they know the truth, but they don't care, okay? Um, and and uh, so, so let's look and see what, what it says here. Verse four, he, the one who is wicked, the one who is, who is, who flat, is flattered by seeing is doing sin, he, plans wickedness upon his bed. Now, this is an interesting thing right there. Um, one of the things that God hates, Rome, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, is the one who devises evil in his heart. He, he, he thinks of it. He works it out. Okay? So he plans wickedness upon his bed. Some people will lay in their bed in the morning and, and, and plan out their day. Or some people maybe do it at nighttime before they go to sleep, plan out their next day. You know, well, here's the plans of this man. What wickedness can I do? What sinful actions can I do? Especially if they feel that they're able to convince other people to, to join in. And so, and so again, this idea, he is, he is planning wickedness on a bed. He sets himself on his bed, in his heart. Remember what Jesus said, as a man is in his heart, thus you know, as, What's that? So is, yeah, such as he. You know, this is what he's going to do. But it's what happens to this man. He plans wickedness upon his bed. He sets himself on a path that is not good. And here's the problem. Here's the problem with everyone who is in the midst of sin and has determined, I'm going to keep doing it. I don't want to do the right thing. All right. He does not despise evil. Now, this is an important, mature place to get, all right? We need to get to the point where we have the same attitude towards evil as God does. What's really tough is having the same idea uh, towards a particular sin that we have a difficulty in doing or wanting to do, you know, our particular bad temptation. But one of the ways to get past that bad temptation is to, is to develop an attitude like God does towards the sin that that temptation is being is drawing us towards. He does not despise evil. Okay? And so there's the attitude of the maturing of the maturing heart to come to a decision that I hate sin, even my favorite sin. 
I hate it and therefore need to change from it. And I use that phrase, favorite sin. You know what I mean? I mean, those things that for each one of us, particularly, we struggle with at some one time or another in our lives. One of the ways to get past it is to develop the right attitude towards it. Yes. Consider consider the, the difference between an individual like this and then one who who gets the peace that passes all understanding yeah. and how much how much better off it is to be able to lay down at night and sleep and rest and peace rather than lay awake and worry about doing something evil. Yeah. The difference is, is amazing. Yeah. And, and that one with peace with, with that surpasses all understanding is because he knows he's right with God. The one who has that right. kind of peace. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other man doesn't care or at the moment doesn't care, but you know what? One day he will care about yeah, not being right with God. He will care a lot, you know. Um, uh, okay, now look at verse five. We're gonna we are making a huge comparison here. We're gonna be comparing the man in verses one through four to God. Now, someone on this earth who is trying to do their best doesn't compare very well to God either, do they? <laughs> you know. But now we're gonna be comparing this debase individual. To God. Look at what it says. Your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. And by the way, not just comparing them to God just, just for that purpose, but drawing off of what we see in, in verse 1. There is no fear of God before his eyes. Now, we really need to recognize one of the fears of God is what God will do to us if we don't get our lives right. Another fear we should have is to not have God on our side protecting us. Look at how it says in verse 5. Your loving kindness, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. God had, God is batting a thousand right now on keeping his promises. That's a, that's a bad thing for those who are doing evil. That's a good thing for those who are doing right. God keeps his promises, his promise to be our God, His promises to help us in time of need. His promises to help us as we strive to do his will. Okay? So he says, your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. I I find that interesting. He's talking to God. Your righteousness is like your mountains. Okay? Your mountains are very high. Ten minutes? Okay, thank you. Your mountains are very high. Your righteousness are are right up there. You know, He's he's making a... just, just something that is overwhelming of thought when you see the high mountains. Well, God's righteousness is high. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. There's a comparison. Comparison here mentioning faithfulness and righteousness. His faithfulness is because of his promises, and his righteousness is determined by his holiness. Amen. Amen. God is light; in Him is no darkness. He right. wi- He does the right thing because He is light. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's why it's impossible, for instance, as the Hebrew writer says, it's impossible for God to lie. Hebrews chapter 6. It's impossible for God to lie. Why is that? Because that's darkness. His righteousness is like the mountains. Okay. It's just so high. Um, your judgments are like a great deep. Now, again, that's a, that's a very bad thing for those who are, who are not getting themselves right with God. His judgments are deep. And then and and you're not just gonna um, get off. He's, but it also is a good thing for those who do follow his will. Remember that God judges our works, whether they're good or evil. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse ten. We'll be judged upon that purpose point. <laughs> Excuse me. And of course, for the Christian, the evil things are taken about, taken care of by the blood of Christ. And so in, in that day, when we are judged, our good is still going to be seen. Our evil that we have committed and repented of, made right with God, is going to fall on Christ and not on us. Has already fallen on Christ and not on us. Okay. Um, you know, this, this verse brings out something else, too, Albert, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Not only does God care for his creation, that is mankind, but he also cares for the beast, you know, when 
when we read in Luke 12, uh, that he even sees when a sparrow falls. Right. And so he's, he's very, he's very attentive to all things that happens because he's over the whole world. <laughs> Amen. And that is the next, next part in our verse. O oh Lord, you preserve man and beast. Exactly. Yeah. God, God takes care of all, um, his creation. He cares about all and he has the power and the foresight and the knowledge to care for all. I mean, there's just no getting past it's better to be on God's side than to be against God. Okay. Verse 7. How precious is your loving kindness, O God, and the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. This is similar to what Jesus Christ said to Jerusalem in, uh, in, in Matthew 23, 23, I think it is. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou who stonest the prophets... How often I would have loved to gather you under my wings like a hen does her chicks, okay? To protect you, to care for you. And of course, Jesus is God in the flesh. That was, that was for, for over a thousand years that Jerusalem was, was in God's, was being God's city, the city of God. And God always wanted to protect her. Well, here we see the idea that the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Which children of men? Those who are striving to do God's will. They, they recognize his protection and they are protected by God. They drink their fill of the abundance of your house and you give them to the drink of the river of your delights. So God, God, uh, God extends this to men who are wishing to follow them. And by the way, that last thing, and you give them to drink of the river of your delights. Think about that word delights for a moment. And think about what the word grace means. Grace means favor. God favors you. God delights in you. Read that, ver read that last half of that verse again. You give them to drink of your grace. You give them to drink of the river of your delights. All right. You favor them. And God's favor is able to take care of our mistakes. God's favor is able to do that. We need to stay in his favor. Okay. For with you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Jesus preached that also to the woman as well. And he said, when you drink of this water, you will never thirst. Right. Yeah. The, the water he has to give, and that, you know, the water of life, the you know, life. again falls back on that idea. Okay, verse nine, four. Now everything he just said. Let me read verse eight again. They drink of your their fill of your abundance of your house, and you gave them to drink of the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life, and there's what you're talking about that Jesus said to the woman at the at the well. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. Again, God is light. In him, there is no darkness. So when we look at your ways, we look, when we look at who you are, when we look at what you're offering, it is good. It is right. Righteousness is what we are able to gain from you, is what we're able to be when we're with you. Verse 10. John 1, 4. Go ahead. Christ, Christ is the light of the world. He being the light, verse 14 of that chapter, that the light is Christ. Christ is the word. Yeah. And so the word gives us light. That's right. That's right. You get, yeah. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. A light right. unto my way. Very good. Now, look with me now. Verse 10. Oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you. And your upright and your rightness to the upright in heart. Okay, so so uh, David is basically praying something God's going to do. This is like we talk about in the example prayer: "Give us this day our daily bread." And then later on in, in that same chapter, Jesus says, "God knows what you need; He's going to give it to you, but you need to pray about it." Well, this is the psalmist is doing that. Oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you. And your righteousness to the uprightness in the upright in heart. Um, and by the way, also in that same chapter I just mentioned, Matthew six, at the end, of, near the end of Matthew six, it says, "But seek first the kingdom of God and His 
righteousness. And all these things will be given unto you. So continue your righteousness to the upright in heart. All right. That, that gaining God's righteousness, that being right in his way. I also wanted to mention that word know. Uh, to those who know you. You know, a lot of people get this idea, if you just believe in Jesus, um, intellectual, intellectual understanding, then you're okay. No, that believe in him or that know him is, a, is, a, is an intimate, close relationship connected with him. This is the word, um, this, uh, this word, the word know um, is used in, um, uh, I'm, I need to check and make certain it's the same Hebrew word, but this is the idea of what it says in, Ma in Genesis chapter 4 when it says Adam knew his wife Eve and they, they bore a son and named him Cain. That knowing is an intimate relationship. And you know what intimate relationship I'm talking about there. But it's talking about that closeness, that intimate relationship. Well, the same idea, know God, have an intimate relationship, be close to him. Okay. Verse 11, let not the foot of pride come upon me and let not the hand of the wicked drive me away. This is talking about those people who are not godly. This is talking about the, the, the idea of verses one through four. That man, when it says the foot of pride, is talking about don't let them keep, don't let them hurt me. Don't let them overcome me, overwhelm me. That, that idea that David is praying about is God is his God is his protection. God is who I take refuge under his the shadow of his wings. God is the one I need to be following. Good morning, Bonnie. Get ready to be cut off. Oh great. Okay. Sorry. Um uh there the doers of iniquity have fallen. They have been thrust down and cannot rise. Where? On their own pride, on their own wickedness. There they are their own worst enemies. And David has seen it. Okay, Facebook, I just lost Zoom. But, and David has seen it. He's recognizing that they are losers. And I don't mean that as the insult that we use. I mean, they, they, they lose in the end. They are, might as well be recognized as losing now. Okay. So uh, they're, they're the doers of iniquity have fallen. They have been thrust down and cannot rise. They've lost. Now, they have the opportunity to come to God. They have the opportunity to make themselves right. But they have lost. Um, let's go to God. And, and, and they have lost, and so therefore they need to get connected with God and no longer be losers, people who have lost, but instead be on the winning side. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and what it and what it means to us and how it can show us, Father, your ways, your truth, the right way we should be. Help us, Father, to strive to be of the right heart, to not be like the evil ones we the evil ones we read about in the first four verses of this psalm, but instead, Father, to despise evil and to do what we can to get the sins that we commit out of our lives. Leaning upon you, Father, for help in that way and also for forgiveness, Father, of the sins that we have committed and do commit. But help us, Father, to strive always to do your will. We love you. We trust you. We give ourselves over to you. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Thank you all. Appreciate it.